Let's rock and roll, boys. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Nintendo podcast. I'm Matt Schultz. I'm hosting today, and I'm joined by none other than Austin Cummings. Hey, Matt. And a great, good old friend and friend of the show, Jordan Weiner. Hey, Matt. Jordan is um, a good friend of mine from grad school and uh, also a big Nintendo fan um, of old and new. What's your, like, Nintendo... I don't know, like, what's your Nintendo history lineage? What, how did you find yourself into the a wonderful world of, uh, of Mario? So I had the privilege of having a dad who was a huge video gamer. So growing up, we had every possible game system. We even had a Dreamcast. We were definitely a big right. video game household. Um, so that's how I got introduced to Nintendo. Um, growing up, watching my dad play everything on the N64 and then playing myself Um Paper Mario on the N64 was the first game I ever beat by myself, which was a big win yeah. for me. Um, and <laughs> I grew up reading like the Ocarina of Time player's guide as like mm. a fun thing to read before bed. I was just super into the lore of Zelda. Um, so would definitely consider myself a, a big Nintendo fan and um, particularly Zelda is uh, one of my preferred uh, franchises. Yeah, I love Zelda. He's a powerful boy. Jordan, I have a ser- <laughs> uh, similar story for myself. I also, uh, my father growing up, um, he's very into rugby. <laughs> the, um, but yes, that does sound nice. Also, to have a Dreamcast, that's amazing. And to have the your, the VMU, you might recall, the, that little that little uh, memory card-ish screen. Oh, yeah. The like yeah. Controller. The controller. yeah, it was like a little Tamagotchi. Yeah. But you, so you could raise like your chows from Sonic. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You can take them in and out. It's kind of the original Switch in a lot of ways. Kind of the progenitor, I'm sure. You know, you take it on the go, you put a snap it in there. Let's raise the chow. Is nothing, but I can at least see the screen. <laughs> can we talk about the chow for a minute? Did you play Sonic Adventure 2 when you like raised your chow? Oh, or was that four. also on you, Sega? Yeah, Adventure 2 Battle? That it was, was on Dreamcast on as well, but it also on It was on, on both, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the battle. You could raise them in that little area. And you can like kind of... F- you could, Yeah, exactly. exactly. There were multiple like areas dark. in that place. Oh, yeah, there were the dark yeah, ones. Exactly. Jordan's onto it. <laughs> There's like the dark realm and the heaven realm and like the normie realm, um, which is kind of where <laughs> I did my best work. The, um, you could like feed them the animals too, and they would like kind of morph. Oh, they would kind yeah. of animorph partially into that. Oh, gosh. I that, was hot. that is coming back to me now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. We'll pause the podcast here for a minute. We can all kind of soak on that. Um, but yes, know that. Jordan, it's great to have you here. Thank you for joining this show. I know it's a lot of pressure. The, uh, you know, the, the threat of stardom. Yeah, stakes uh, are high. Fame, but being on You're the really podcast. And, yeah, exactly. So don't, so don't, don't even worry about that one bit. Uh, here, so. I won't let it go to my head. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, stay humble out there. That's one of our mottos for the show. Uh, snappy and quick and humble. Yeah. So yeah. So first, before we jump into a little Zelda talk, because we've all, all of us have played it enough. Both Jordan and I have beat it. But does anyone have a uh, oh, shame topic? Like yes. Don't only shame. just two of us. <laughs> yeah. Austin bought it. Uh, Austin, you have any other anything else you want to talk about? prior to yeah some other things i purchased okay so quick thing other games we've been playing in the world of the big end so um by viewers of the video youtube uh podcast will be able to tell right away i've been playing ring fit adventure (laughs) whole new me um yeah you look at but i have been playing that and also as someone who played very briefly uh we fit which is to say owned it (laughs) uh, for the wii u in fact and it had also a little tamagotchi ish the pedometer and uh, it's awesome. Like, it's much more involved than we Fit as far as just, like, a personal exercise tool. And the um, the story is, like, totally cute. The enemy design is clever and funny in the same way that it feels a little bit like Dragon Quest-ish. Or Dragon Quest, many of the enemies, their names are little puns uh, that, are, that are cute. And in the case of this... Uh, me- Many of the enemies are exercise equipment that have that are animated. Which is the worst way. exercise equipment? And um, like kettlebells and things like that. Um, I can tell you what's the worst: <laughs> squats, just normal old squats. <laughs> and also, and you have to beat uh, like World Two before you unlock like type advantages. And before you get that far, I'll tell you like. So I started this game thinking I was just a just a big old champ. I I was like I want the challenge of an exercise, and maybe I can maybe I can do some slightly harder difficulty. 
But as it turned out, it was in fact uh, very hard. And I was totally sweating, uh, like in intensely. And many of the exercises you do, the attacks you perform, you do a squat to perform the attack against a basic enemy, but you squat like 25 times or whatever for like one attack. And you might be attacking a lot to just to fight a normal enemy. So you'll end up doing like a lot of the of same so many reps <laughs> yeah well you have different moves and they have to recharge so you have to introduce some variety i'm amazed by how well the joy con work like it, it i've only had to recalibrate it a couple of times and largely it feels like it's tracking everything authentically strong endorsement uh for it for people who are interested uh because it is challenging and fun and has a good sense of humor jordan can you see yourself playing a game like this I did play Wii Fit. I had a, a Professor Snape, uh, me, or avatar, <laughs> and I right. would do uh, um, the late Alan Rickman. Yeah, he loved Wii Fit. <laughs> he did. That's the main <laughs> thing we all remember about him. Um, no, I did not. I did not know about this game, but you've piqued my interest. I recently yeah. got into yeah. running, and I feel like I need like a good, you know, like cross training routine, and maybe, maybe this. Okay, is the then way. let me keep going for another ten minutes <laughs> on this because what I was going to say is the one complaint I have with doing Ring Fit, the one thing that stops me from doing like a full, maybe quote unquote exercise, is because of the maybe the cardio element. The game does have you run in place somewhat, but it feels mm. like this. It feels more like this is not the best use of my time as far as exercise. Whereas the the motions, whether it's a plank or um, some type of press with the ring feel more like a traditional exercise. So I think it pairs really well with like doing a short 20 minute or so jog, like as a warm up. It's like a very fun application of these things and really honestly impressive it. If it, I think if, uh, if it sounds like exciting to you, the listener, as far as like, Oh, maybe this is something that would make me want to do a, you know, 30 minute exercise paired with a yeah. warm up, maybe cardio. Um, then it's definitely good enough reason I think to buy. I have one more one more question about the game before we move on. So when the uh, like announcement for the announcement came out, do you remember this? The the like cryptic YouTube video like detailing parts of the world. Yep. Well, yeah, I what, hate it. Still what did hate the it. parts of the world have to do with the game? <laughs> Why did it like go from Japan to? Well, Matt, you'll notice that the cowboy oh, represents yes. Texas. And that <laughs> that represents America, baby. Yeehaw. Is that any part of the game? Um, Has it anything to do with nothing. it? Nothing. You're running through an area that looks like kind of a little lightly Breath of the Wildish or something that's like within a okay. kind of temple dungeonish setting. Um you know, there's there's cool connectivity in the same way we fit had where you can see metrics from other players generally, but uh it's a pretty solo experience. There are mini games, and some of which you encounter in the story mode. So um oh, okay. But yes, nothing to do with that trailer. <laughs> That trailer still is dreadful. Although it got us talking about it, which doesn't <laughs> take much here on AMP, but we did it. Speaking all the of same. talking about things, let's talk about Zelda. Link's Awakening for a final time. Uh, we've been playing this game. Uh, uh, some of us have beaten the game, like <laughs> I mentioned earlier. Where does this rank for you in terms of Zelda games that you've played? That's a good question. Also, disclaimer for the audience that I, I did not play the original Link's Awakening, so this was my first exposure to the game. Yeah, um, and yeah in fact, allow it. Don't even worry about that. <laughs> my, my mother will allow you to have skipped uh, that game. Should that <laughs> <laughs> and actually, people might call me a, a not a not true Zelda fan, as I have pretty much only played the 3D games. I um, I need to go back and actually play like a Link to the Past and stuff. If, um, if anyone comments on our YouTube and dunks on us, I would be thrilled. If anyone comments at all, <laughs> so please. Um, uh, I've, um, I've gotten three dungeons into this game, so dunk away, audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think um, it is definitely a much more compact, like a much shorter game than other Zeldas that I've played. Mm -hmm. um, I loved the art style. I liked how I felt like in some ways it was more challenging than the Zeldas I was used to, and in other ways it was a lot less challenging. So. Mm -hmm. Just having it be slightly different um, was exciting. I thought I was really impressed by the design of some of the temples. I thought the Eagle's Tower one in yeah. particular was one of the best uh, Zelda dungeons that, that I had played. And so that was awesome. Um, I really loved that. I liked the the game really didn't hold your hand before the boss. Like there was no nice, pleasant room where you could get your fairy and like be all prepped. And if you lost to the boss, you had to like make your way all the way back in. Um, on the other hand, I, I felt like there were many elements that were much, much easier than the like puzzles that yeah. I've come to know. So 
Um, no, that's not a, a definitive ranking. To me, it just felt really different um, from the other Zelda games. So in that way, it was it was refreshing. I kept thinking as I was playing through the dungeons, and I think to me, the dungeons were my favorite part of the game. That and just the quirkiness of the entire thing. Like, tr truthfully, mm -hmm. and, I mean, I guess we're going to get into spoiler ter territory. So if, I mean, at this point, like, we'll see you in the next podcast. Because I don't know, Austin, you played the whole game already, right? In a different, in a different version, DX. Yeah, I've beaten it on. Okay. Yeah, the DX version. Um, for a Game Boy. The you know the the whole plot I think to me was I, I loved it. I lo I just love the idea that the Zelda team was like, okay, this is going to be, you know, within this giant creature, the Windfish's dream, right? And what does that look like? And what's manifesting? Yes, I loved it, but I wanted it to be even weirder. I like all these all these theories about how it's going to pan out. I was like, maybe the owl is evil, and like he's like, you know, like maybe the maybe the windfish is the final boss. I was mm -hmm. convinced. Maybe the windfish is the friends we make along the way. Yeah, I I oh. I felt like there. I was like slightly more. There could have mm -hmm. been um, when you go into the the egg at the end that was so creepy that i was like ready for the game to just go all the way and then it didn't it didn't quite yeah. go all the way but it was so weird compared to i think i Zelda think games, similarly the the dungeons so awesome. were yeah. what i was saying is like i going throughout the game i kept thinking oh, god whoever played this on the original system and then on the dx like this is a like this is hard this is like this would be a hard game it definitely got it got easier and i think because it was easy from the start it made it much easier throughout the rest of the game. Uh, similar to Breath of the Wild and, and some of the criticism around that where like it's brutally mm -hmm. hard when you first start and you've got nothing and you're just trying to survive and you're just trying to avoid any sh like sharp object <laughs> or like enemy mm -hmm. projectile at all costs because you have literally a, a half a heart left. Um, and you have no idea where the fairies are because in, I think you can't cut grass and find hearts in the hard mode, right? It was just like right. you had to find a fairy... You can find pits, and you just fall right, right, right in. in. And you say, there goes, a full, <laughs> there goes a full heart. I guess I'll just die. So I guess what I was going to ask you, Jordan, uh, and, and Austin, from your playthrough all the way through DX, but most recently, I mean, just your general experience from the game, was what, is, what was a favorite aspect or moment that you had with Link's Awakening? Uh, for me, I have to... The, really, I was just really impressed by the Eagle's Tower as a dungeon. I felt like it was the hardest dungeon in the game, and the moment where I like put together what I was supposed to do with the ball to crush the pillars was like one of the best like Zelda aha moments um, for yeah. me, and that's one of my favorite things about Zelda is when you like finally put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, uh, so that that was probably one of my, my favorite moments when playing. I think I actually said out loud, oh, like, that's what I have to do. Um, so uh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that was cool. And it was hard because I had like one pillar left and I could mm. not freaking find it or remember where it was. And then and then when I finally figured it out, I like where that pillar need, I needed to go. I had like I felt like it was the most convoluted way for me to get that ball back to where I like I felt like I just didn't do it in the right order. And I felt a lot of, of, of like that way about the game sometimes in the dungeons where I felt mm. like I just kind of like happened into the answer um, or just kind of got lucky like with a pattern. You know, I didn't have to think too logically. I was like, well, let me, okay, maybe if I do that, no oh, crap, I don't know, let me move them back. Oh shit, <laughs> I, Pika, uh, I did it. Like I didn't realize I was solving it, but I solved it. Um, Cause some of those puzzles were they got pretty challenging, like how you mm. like the, or the pattern puzzles that you'd have to do in certain rooms. Um, but yeah, that was that was one of my fav favorite dungeons as well. But what was the face one? There's something like the the the, the like temple of faces. Oh yeah, that was a cool one too. It was the one where you walked in initially, and to get access to it, you had to battle that giant. Dude, that, that took me forever. Around. That was one of the hardest bosses yes. in the game for me huge armored bull guy who just hops around and just kills you over and over again and if i had no idea how to beat him and it just and i kept trying you mm -hmm. kept using all my weapons like what was what, what what was the moment you were like okay this is this is how i know this is gonna work like how many times did you die i was that? playing that on my switch on an airplane and i was really frustrated because normally my approach to zelda is i'll like try 10 times on my own and then after that i'll be like oh fine i'll like do a quick google just to point me in the right direction which maybe for some people they would you know would be sad to hear that's my approach <laughs> but that is what makes the game enjoyable for me and so i was trapped on this airplane with no way of looking up to do um so i found that one 
particularly frustrated. I ended up like walking away and doing a bunch of other stuff. And then I think finally by accident, I like happened to hit it with a spin attack and was like, oh, I have to do, um, that's what I have to do. But that one, that was a super frustrating one. I would like to hop in here and say that the lack of uh, easy airplane Googling for puzzles and things is uh, the bane of my existence. And it is so frustrating. (laughs) (laughs) This summer for the travel I was doing and playing a lot of Fire Emblem, I had like on my phone recorded like a long screen capture of the full list of like lost items Mm. for Fire Emblem, like the things to give back to all the classmates who have lost like the a certain pen or like, you know, the mad like when you're running around the. Yeah, the church sanctuary. Um, Yeah. Monastery. And so um, it would be like this, just, uh, I'd like get an item and just scroll, let's watch this very slow scroll video. <laughs> over and over <laughs> again. Unable, <laughs> over and over again. It was so dreadful. And then inevitably just go to every student and try to give them every item until they capitulated and took the thing. Um, I, I would say that for Link's Awakening, for me on the Switch, the thing that definitely stands out the most and I th- feels the highlight of the game is the it has its distinct visual identity, which I appreciate. The fun dollhouse appearance to Link's Awakening is really its strongest aspect, I feel, in many respects. I do wish the frame rate were more consistent between the 60 and 30 frames, uh, which is a gripe that I feel uh, a lot, but the overall game, I especially when looking at the Game Boy games when they came out, Link's Awakening you know, first, and then we had Oracle of Ages and Seasons, uh, all three of those, they look very similar to one another, and they all look like simpler versions of A Link to the Past for the Super Nintendo. And um, I always felt like for those games, I, I would you know, kind of imagine the sprites uh, in how they appeared in the strategy guide, very colorful, and uh, Link was portrayed like he looked in uh, kind of Majora's Mask, and it had, the game itself lacked a really strong sense of those designs, and I love how it looks yeah. on the Switch. And I definitely feel that's one of the like strongest aspects to it um i i also enjoy just having for these style of zelda games like you because it's like a neat little package and you feel this way because of the visuals that again have this kind of contained dollhouse feel like you know everything is right there so if you're in a dungeon it's like the solution is somewhere within these few rooms i have access Mm -hmm. to and so that's always like a really fun puzzle solving feeling where it's like i know all the tools are at my disposal and so it's a matter of you know, trying something in a new way mm-hmm. or maybe re-exploring a room that I thought had finished. The puzzle solving is, uh, itself is really fun. I do feel like a lot of the items, you know, feel standard, uh, which is not a surprise given the context of the game when it came out. But it's true. The items are a little boring. There's only one instance where you actually needed to have a bow and arrow in Link's Awakening, I think. I think you could have gotten through without the bow and arrow except for like one part in the final dungeon where you have to shoot an arrow at like one switch, which... Like, yeah, there was, was like shoot an arrow at the eye and like if you like look at the pattern on the ground, it's like an arrow right. pointing at the eye and, you know, you put the beak in there and you're like, oh, okay, cool. Thank God I have the arrow. Right. Um, worth 900 rupees for that one moment. Um, worth yeah. <laughs> theft. Also the magic rod or whatever, the ice rod, I don't know. The thing you got in the last dungeon you literally used twice and then you never yeah. need it again. Yeah, that. That was upsetting. I think that's that's also a pervasive feeling, and I think that's part of the reason why I'm not quite into it so much this time, uh, having played it recently on the th- when it came back out for 3DS as well. But the um, as we've talked about before on the show, but you know the game was kind of a proof of concept of having a link to the past, which uh, you know would be the you know second Zelda game in effect, uh, but having a version of that for the Game mm-hmm. Boy, and so I I feel like it it does lack a bit of its own quirk. It feels more like the impressive element for it at the time was to adapt a full-scale Zelda experience for Portable, which it does very well, right. but it doesn't kind of have its own set of mechanics. It feels definitely... Do you think that this was... Um, like, what do you think the intent on Nintendo was to select this specific game for port to the Switch? What, like, why why this game? I mean, if I, if I had to guess, I would just say it's because they know a lot of people are likely nostalgic for it and it's one they can you know recreate without having to reinvent right. the wheel you know it's not cool. i think it would be hard to go back to a a 3d zelda let's say um you know even a majora's mask remake that everyone's been clamoring for for and you know hd console outside the they the did put a, Majora, remake, but a majora's mask 
in uh, Link Between Worlds. It's hanging up there in the store. And they did, but it, but it was in. But they had the 3DS yeah. remake, yeah. Like, also of it. So I think that's our our count one. But the, you know, I think it'd be hard to go back to a 3D Zelda meet like Breath of the Wild because it would feel very constrained. Whereas this one is definitively a different style experience. And it, you know, you don't play this and go like, I wish it more. You know, I wish I could pick up this stick and attack this. You know, Bacoblin. You never feel that in Link's Link's mm-hmm. Awakening because it feels like, oh, this is yeah. a retro, different experience. I worry if you went back and played Skyward Sword, part of you'd be like, wow, this feels very linear in comparison to Breath of the Wild. Oh, well, it might be a fun game to end the segment would be to compare it to two other Zelda games. So saying like Link's, to rank it somewhat, mm-hmm. like for me personally, Link's Awakening, I would say it's better than a, I'm going to go kind of hot take on this. Spirit Tracks? Um, <laughs> well, no, Spirit Tracks is better. I think that it's better than a Phantom Hourglass, but it's, okay. honestly, I would, well, big picture. I'm going to say it's better than a <laughs> Twilight Princess. It's not as good as a Phantom Hourglass. And the reason why I feel this way is just because Interesting. Um, even though Phantom Hourglass particularly has its own you know, set of quirks, uh, it invents in a different way with the touchscreen controls and the puzzles that come uh, you know, henceforth. And Twilight Princess is a very long Zelda game that doesn't really do a lot new i think this is probably if i had to revisit one i would certainly play link's awakening again even though i like twilight princess and i've played it through twice um including hd the hd remake yeah which is like barely hd it looks so terrible <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's hd in it terms of resolution well, but it just is like needs that game needs a whole new non-muddy looking art direction but the uh, that game needs a no yeah. more hour and a half long like, intro sequence it's so slow <laughs> so long on that farm Odon yeah. Ranch or whatever it is. You're there forever. Those damn Rams. <laughs> Jordan, how would you rank this in your console console Zelda games? That's so instead? tough because I truly feel like this one is so different. Like there are many things that I love about Twilight Princess and many things that frustrated me, but that's such like a longer, more involved game uh, that I like feel For weird sure. comparing it. Um, and so I don't know. I think... I have a, I just have a really hard time placing this one because it just to me feels like such a different experience. This was like a like a light, fun, like very compact um, experience um, compared mm-hmm. to like what I typically expect to get out of a Zelda game. Um, so I'm not sure. To me, it's like sort of in its own its own little uh, category, just based on the Zelda games that yeah. I've played. Yeah, it definitely feels like uh, like a spinoff special of your favorite TV show. You know, you're like, oh, cool. Like, I get a little more of, like, the characters mm-hmm. I love, but, like, in a different wacky setting that, like, really doesn't, like, affect the main story. I don't know. Like, it, it, it definitely feels like a little treat. Yeah, like when, like when Netflix is Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the spooky adventure of Sabrina <laughs> had, like, the Christmas episode after season one, but before season two, like, that's, like... <laughs> right. It's the Wookiee Christmas special in Star Wars. Like, what? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I didn't need to know about Chewbacca's family at all, but here we go. Um, but now you'll never forget. <laughs> and I think that yeah, to me, it's, it. oh sorry, no, 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 you got it. Oh no, <laughs> to me it's like like I love to pick up Wind Waker every once in a while and just play for like a couple hours and like beat Dragon Roost and like have my like fun with it because mm-hmm. it's pretty non stressful. I can just like <laughs> um, make my way through it and um uh and it's like so fun and like bright. Uh, to me, this game like fulfills yeah. a really similar purpose. Like it's like engaging, it's fun, it's like not super stressful. Um, uh, that's a different experience than if I'm looking for like a Breath of the Wild, like very involved um, Zelda yeah. experience. No, it definitely the commitment is very different, and 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 I feel like in a lot of positive ways. I think when I again back to Twilight Princess, that game is good. It's a different experience, but it is also kind of uh, it's you know it's it's yeah. more of a slog certainly in that uh, in this in the scale and the the pace for a long portion of the game. They like compared to the Oracle games, which are the most direct comparison for this. Yeah, this game has a, a story and a mood that's more interesting than those. They don't, they don't really do anything particularly special in that way, but they have more interesting mechanics with their 
uh, adjustment of the seasons is really, really clever between the four and um, spoilers. And also uh, an Oracle of Ages yeah. to do the time hopping like Link to the Past is cool. But the stories themselves, could, that, you know, and this one has just enough story, but it is not intrusive. On the next episode, we'll talk about Pokemon. And I do feel like an issue I have with the mo- most recent Pokemon games, and um, particularly, has been that the the story and the characters do feel like they get in the way often of mm-hmm. like what you want to be mm-hmm. doing. And it Link's Awakening is not. Yeah. For me, it felt most similar to Wind Waker, I think mostly just because of the art style. And they're me- like, as you continue going in Wind Waker, much, much different. But the art style and like the initial um, kind of breeziness uh, of the game felt really similar to me. The I I think that's a great answer. I think that if they dug it and they were interested in more Zelda, it'd be like, oh well, this is I think mood wise, and Wind Waker also balances you know highs and lows and uh, in a mood way. And for the most part, the dungeon design itself in Wind Waker is similar to Link's Awakening in that it, it, there there are not any huge mechanics until the end uh, of the game where you use the Waker to control other characters. But outside of that, the most of the dungeons are a little more clear cut. Um, and most of the inventiveness when Waker comes in the, you know, traversing the map via the boat. But um, yeah, I think I would recommend that as a, a place to go after this. I think if someone wasn't into this, it would be a question of why necessarily did they not dig it. And if it was because of linearity, then, you know, Breath of the Wild would be the obvious. I tell you what uh, I would love to know, see suggestion. is um, I loved I loved the kind of like top down style Zelda games and. I really would love to see more of that on a console. Um, so much so that I would love to see like this. Not, maybe not like necessarily the art style because I think they've all like lately they've been playing with that art style, especially with um, a link between worlds. You know, a lot of people were kind of hit or miss with like Zelda Link's like aesthetic and look and hair and all that. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's bad. But but ultimately, like I would love to see another bigger game in like kind of a top down vein and like. I just think it'd be so cool to have like an even even like an open world version of of this style of game, you know, just one that like you could there was no you know like mm, the walls. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I, you could still say there are walls, but like imagine you know that island like five times the size of what it was, you know, or just even more built out with even more dungeons and things yeah. to explore. And like that to me is is just so cool. I think it, what could also be just cool in that same vein is uh, if they were to use VR for a game like uh, Link's Awakening in that a lot of VR experiences are like little uh, dioramas. Like you're kind of in a box and you're looking at all the things and there's a few interactable objects. But it could be cool to be feel like you're in the dollhouse of Link's Awakening. You know, I think Breath of the Wild didn't lend itself perfectly to the VR experience, but having like little puzzle rooms that have the, you know, fantastic art style of Link's Awakening. Yeah, uh, could be really inviting. Anything on your Zelda wish list, uh, Jordan? Before we move on, more swords. Um, Zelda <laughs> wish list. Five swords. <laughs> um, so, uh, the best in the Zelda series. I, <laughs> my three complaints with Breath of the Wild were mm-hmm. no hook shot. I wanted like more rousing mm-hmm. Hyrule Field music and was and highly disappointed I did not kiss. get it. And I wanted Let <laughs> Link kiss <laughs> Ganon. Whoever. Oh Ganon, <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> that so. was it. That was number three. Um uh, and more more yeah. temples. I miss temples. So I elephant? want all of those things to be in the yeah. new Breath of the Wild. Yeah, which we will <laughs> Elephant didn't sucked. do it. Elephant didn't do it for me. My theory, I'm putting it out there, which I'm not. I'm definitely like the five million person with this theory is that there's gonna be. It's gonna be some kind of like. There's a dark version of Hyrule that you are exploring and yeah. things you do in one version. That would be very impact fun. Like, the original version. That's my theory and like my my hope for that game. So that that is my wish list. They do that in uh, low yeah, rule, so, like between worlds. I, yeah, yeah, I would like that too because they have always played in like the past plays with that. You know the oracle of ages the mm-hmm. the duality of a certain area um and those are really fun and exactly Twilight princess i mean in a way yeah like, exactly you know, for sure no for sure go between realms yeah i feel like if they want to keep the open world explorey thing which they probably do and but they have to set this like as a direct sequel to me that that's yeah, the I direction yeah. it would make totally sense to go oh that's so exciting then you could we'll also reuse a lot of the those assets Oop. and landscapes and whatnot but you know switch the 
That'll probably be I mean, a go. year from now. We'll, that game most likely will be in our hands Hopefully. for the holiday mm-hmm. season around when the new consoles are showing up. And, you know, Nintendo has this big, you know, first party property to release. Like, I think that's going to be what we're playing, what we'll see at E3. And that's super exciting. Thank you for listening to another Nintendo podcast. Please check out the description where you can find a link to our YouTube channel. Or uh, please check out the links to the various podcast services of your choosing. And if you like the show, uh, tell you what, if you like the show, don't tell anyone about it. This is just our special thing now. Just you and me, bunny. Check back in uh, each week to hear us sound off on the big end, such as the next episode where we'll talk all about Those pocket monsters, what's the deal with that Pikachu? Stay tuned.